everybody, I'm Jo, I'm one of the Sales and BD Directors here at Albi Medics. Um, I've been with the organisation for many years. I spent 10 years working with the R&D group and now I have a responsibility in the commercial team. Um, and day to day my life is very much involved with supporting our customers and clients in their programmes, be that peptides, proteins, medical devices, diagnostic company. That's great, thank you. Can you introduce for me how Albumedics are working with customers in the COVID-19 space at the moment? Sure, we've got several projects um, with clients that are working in the COVID space. Um, one of those is a medical device customer. Um, they're called Chalice Medical, and they're using the albumin um, to create a biocompatible surface on their oxygenator device. That's obviously really important uh, right now for those patients that are unfortunately, you know, rather ill with COVID. Um, but we also have other projects. So we're working with diagnostic companies. There they use the albumin uh, to prevent surface absorption. And by doing that, we believe um, there are possibilities really to reduce the risk of false positives. Um, and potentially enabling quicker processing. And then finally, we're working with a number of customers that are working on different vaccine types against COVID. So plenty of interesting projects right now and really demonstrating the utility of Albumin. And do you have examples of vaccine customers that Albumedics currently work with? Yes, so um, over a third of our customers are either in the clinical stage or have marketed vaccines. Uh, the most advanced customer that we have is Merck, um, where they use our albumin in their MMR and ProQuad vaccines. So these are vaccines that are used to immunize children against uh, measles, mumps and rubella. Um, and each dose of that vaccine actually contains uh, 0.3 mg of our recombinant albumin. So in order to get to the market, um, obviously a very high level of safety um, was needed and was imposed by the regulatory authorities for authorization of that product. Um, and Merck made that decision back in 2006. So since then, more than 200 million children have been administered that vaccine. What can you tell me about the types of COVID vaccine that are currently being developed and how far along they are? So everything's moving really fast right now. We're getting news reports every day that's, that are giving us new updates. So I'm sure by the time this video comes to air, actually a lot of this will be outdated. But what we can see today, talking to you today, is that uh, currently there are 20 vaccines that have either got to limited approval status or in phase three, which I think is an amazing feat if you think of the time frame since this has been declared a pandemic. Then there's 17 candidates in phase two, 37 in phase one, and numerous other approaches in the preclinical phases. So as we're filming today, um, there's a lot of excitement uh, in, the, in the media, lots of media attention again about the, the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, the Moderna vaccine, the Oxford COVID vaccine, so really exciting time. Um, and when we look across the different types of vaccines that are in development across all those different stages, we can see the whole range of different vaccine types. So subunits, viral vectors, mRNA, DNA, inactivated vaccine candidates, they're all part of the mix. And actually, one of the things that the UK government have done in terms of securing supply of vaccines for the UK population is really to secure supply across all those different vaccine types. And are there any interesting market trends that you're seeing in these different types of vaccines that are being developed? There's a lot of interest right now quite clearly in the mRNA vaccines um, and I think that's primarily driven by the really positive efficacy data that those vaccines have um, 
have uh, appear to have um but also the speed at which that vaccine technology can be developed the speed at which those mrna vaccines can be manufactured following on that note two mrna vaccines are hopefully almost on the market do you have any comment on this it's of course very exciting of course so those vaccine candidates that you're referring to of course come from moderna and from pfizer BioNTech, both of them are mRNA vaccines, which means uh, they are delivering coronavirus genetic material directly into cells to be able to provoke the immune response. Now, the reason that this is particularly interesting is if they make it to approval, this will be the first time that mRNA vaccines have actually made it onto the market. So this is really exciting news. First mRNA vaccines hopefully getting to market. Um, Pfizer obviously announced fairly recently that they had 90% efficacy. Um, and that's really impressive when we look back and think that actually it was only May that they entered phase one, phase two studies. Um, with regards to the development of their vaccine candidates, then they actually looked at two different types. Um, in both cases, uh, volunteers had antibodies and the vaccines provoked an immune response. Um, but actually one of them had significantly less side effects. So the one with the least side effects is the one that is now uh, moving towards approval. So some amazing results there. And then with regards to Moderna, um, they came out probably only a week later Again, efficacy super high, so 94.5%, um, which really makes the mRNA technologies look very, very promising. And what challenges do you see with mRNA vaccines? So the mRNA vaccines, clearly they're very exciting, they're very new. Um, one of the important considerations for any vaccine is cold chain and one of the challenges for the mRNA vaccines uh, is the stability. So the Pfizer-BioNTech um, vaccine needs to be stored at minus 70, and that's important to maintain the integrity of the genetic material that's in the dose that you're gonna be given. Um, and that's gonna present some challenges from a logistical point of view. So how do you ensure that that vaccine that has been very carefully manufactured and uh, uh, assessed can get from the factory to the arm of your patient. Um, and so that minus 70 is, you know, a very, very cold temperature. Um, I, let's call it extreme cold chain. Um, and so in order to, to overcome some of those challenges, um, Pfizer have been working to produce special boxes to think about the way that they can transport uh, their vaccine to the specific site where the patients are going to receive that vaccine. Um, another challenge, this isn't unique to the mRNA vaccines, but there will be two doses needed. And so that just adds some additional complexity with regards to actually vaccinating a population. Um, and then again, thinking about those stability challenges, ensuring fast mass distribution, thinking about how this might work in a third world setting, that's gonna present a challenge. Um, so at Albi Medics, we've really been working hard to engage and inform um, and consider how Albumin might provide a solution to some of those challenges that they're facing.